Forgetting how good 160s sound, and these are smooth. So if we just, what I've got is got the overhead left and right on this. We've got the Jay-Z mics on this. So we're doing Neil Young Heart of Gold, which is like perfect for this sound. We've got the kick, the JZ mic on it, the Jay-Z mic going on it. So obviously LA-28s have really slow release times, as you can see here. Kind of cool in this situation. We're using the Audient ID44, so something we always end up using, so it'll give you a good reference point. And then the snare is just a 57, nothing on it. So I had these overheads set mm, about three to one, just kissing it. The thing I've always noticed with 160 VUs is like if the needle's moving, you're already compressing too much. I hit these, I suppose, slightly harder. It feels just like, it looks like a brand new 160, but it also felt like it sounded like a brand new 160, meaning like super responsive. I have two 165s, which are absolutely superb because they have the variable attack and release. These don't because they're the classic 160s, but I always, not always, but often use my 165s on auto. And when you put them on auto, they just emulate 160s. I don't know. It's a great sounding compressor. The LA-2A, probably the best percussion compressor ever. When we track bass, I think it will come into its own and probably on vocals as well. But yeah, superb. Really loved it. All right, we've got Clark here. I'm quite excited. So this is the DI. It's the Acme. I haven't tried this high pass yet. So can you play something for me, Clark? Bring out the game, bring out the peak reduction. Thank you. 
So the compression is coming on pretty aggressively. Bring it back. Definitely hear more low end going through when it goes to the left. I am ready the instructions. I've just started using. That's the way I work. All I know is that sounds better. Let's go to the bass in. So this is the Cloud 44A. Got about three to one as usual. Now this is the 421. The Apex, a little noise. I'll deal with it. So this is the 421. VU, very excited. We have Jude playing my crappy old piano, which I sorely and dearly, I should say, love. We got that piano. It, it was being thrown out by a studio. We then moved it all the way over to the other studio. Had it tuned once, now we've moved over here. Hasn't been tuned again, so you're going to be dealing with a little bit of that when you download the multi-tracks. As you know, or if you don't know, this is how you set the threshold. It's actually not printing that hot of a signal. I'll go to about three to one in both channels. I like it. Ooh. Bum notes and all. You can definitely hear it grabbing it. The old joke used to be with the uh, with the, the DBX, the 160s, that if you see the needle moving, it's compressing too much. The point is that it gets audible pretty quickly. It only needs to move ever so slightly for it to be compressing. But I love the sound of a DBX 160 compressing. Great. So now we're set. We're ready to rock. Maybe a little bit more level. You know, I'm going to bring up the pre's here a little bit. So I can back up the compression a little bit more and print a bit more level. Sounds fantastic. It's kind of what I want, crappy piano. When we were in Abbey Road a couple of weeks ago, they had like the two pianos the Beatles used. Pretty comparable pianos to be honest. I love my Yamaha. I used to own a Steinway. I, they're all great, but at the end of the day, nothing beats your own personal piano. Hey everyone, Eric here. I am in the hot seat to record the steel guitar using the AudioScape Opto Compressor. We have Tommy here, Tommy de Bourbon, who was actually one of our interns, and luckily he is a genius at steel guitar, and we're so lucky to have him here. Thank you, Tommy, for being here. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So we've got the AudioScape Opto Compressor right here to the side. It's so simple, it's so easy. I freaking love it. Tommy, play some stuff and let's just mess around with this. So here's the settings that we left off with. Uh, I didn't have too much peak reduction going on. This is my first time recording steel guitar, so please, if anyone has any recommendations, please leave them down in the comments below. But from what I have left it, this is what sounded right to me. Uh, peak reduction, I had it low because I don't want to compress it too much. I, it, you can see it does get loud, it gets, it gets dynamic. I, I want to have 3 dB of compression, not too much more. I don't want it to be extreme. I have on compress, and then the gain I've got at 30, uh, just enough to get into a healthy signal into Pro Tools. So this HF knob right over here, I had to look it up just to see what it was. And apparently in the old uh, LA2As, it would be in the back, but AudioScape put it in the front, and so basically counterclockwise, having it turned to the left, 
It's focused more on the high end and it's not compressing the low end as much. So let's see what happens when I turn it towards the right. So it compresses the low end more. So just to get extreme and you can see the meter, the gain reduction is, it's a big difference right there. Turn it back counterclockwise. I had it just about there. And I felt like just messing with it. I felt like that's just where I liked it. Again, I haven't messed with this stuff too much with the LA two-way style off the compressor. Um, I just loved how easy this was just to dial it in. And I didn't think too much into it. I just started twisting knobs. And once I found something that sounded right to me, it I just left it. And it was super quick and easy. Now for the amp, believe it or not, we're actually running through an angle. Uh, now I messed with the settings. I made sure to have it not have any kind of crunch, any distortion. I took it off of clean lead, no gain, uh, keeping it as clean as I can. Um, bass, 12 o'clock, middle, 12 o'clock. Treble looks to be around two. And it just sounded good. And then we're micing it up with the Jay-Z or Jay-Z Black Hole 2, which is just a great mic. I'm putting that on the mandolin and the acoustic guitar as well. I want to live. I want to give. I'm going to gain reduction here. I've been a miner for a heart of gold. It's these expressions I never give. That keep me searching for a heart of gold. Sounds great. And I'm getting old. Well, that was easy. <laughs> now, I mean, an LA 2A doesn't have a particularly fast release time. So I think on a song like this, it's going to be fine. You're not rapping. It's not da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. So I think we'll be, this is perfect. We're getting between three to five dB worth of gain reduction. And to be honest, that's absolutely fine with an LA 2A. It shouldn't sound choked even. You know, at 7 dB. Shh, don't tell anybody. So let's record some vocals. Hey everyone, it's Joe Carroll here in Nashville in the mix room. And I just finished up Heart of Gold, which is featuring the Audioscape 2A optical style compressor, as well as the 260, like the DBX 160 VU meter. I'll just tell you right out of the gate, I'm, I'm a very big Audioscape fan. Uh, just right over here in the rack, I have the Decomp. I have the blue stripe. I have the black stripe revision F. I have uh, two uh, 3A style compressors right here. So I'm a fan. That said, Warren and Eric, as you can see, when you, let's look at the screen as a matter of fact. And you can see there's pretty heavy compression on everything. In fact, what this reminds me of is when I get old masters that were, were cut on analog and because they had limited tools and they tried to get up, you know, up into the, above the noise floor and stuff, things were, were printed with a lot more compression than a lot of times we print nowadays. And so this actually looks strikingly uh, like like working on analog, which is fun. You know, I mean, commit commit to something, right? As you can see, the, the kick drum, the snare drum here, and the overheads are all, you know, pretty heavily compressed. And I bet that's the 260 bass guitar. Same thing. You can see that they're they're getting hit. Piano here, acoustic guitar here. You can see, you know, I mean, our, our peaks are pretty are pretty consistent. And then we have our vocals down here, which you can see have more dynamic range left. And we'll get into the fact that what I did to counteract that. Overwhelmingly, what I did is I didn't use compression. First of all, I didn't need to, but I wanted you guys to hear the compression from those two units and not what I was doing. So there's some stereo bus stuff, of course, and there's a couple little tricks on the drums. In fact, let, let's just dive into the drums. So w when Warren sent this to me, he, his, he was like, hey, do whatever you want to do. Have fun. And I listened to the original, you know, to refresh myself, and it was very vibey, but I wouldn't say it was hi-fi whatsoever. So I thought, well, let's just make it a little more modern. Let's freshen it up. So I'll show you a couple tricks that I did. So on the drums, here we go. The drums by themselves with nothing but some EQ. And I did, to get more snap out of the snare drum, I did use a little uh, compression on the uh, channel strip of the SSL and the distressor with, as you can see, a slow attack, but fast release to try to get a, just a little more snap out of it. So here's the dry drums with only EQ. Okay, it's cool. It's got a thing, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's doing what it needs to do. Trick number one, I have this aux here 
that I use with a uh, with an aux sin. That way, instead of just putting the whole drum kit into parallel compression, I can put whatever I want to into parallel compression, it, whatever amount I want to. So here's what the parallel compression sounds like, and I believe it was only snare drum. Okay, so what that I can tuck that up underneath it, and it's going to give us more volume, of course. But it's more than that; it's going to give us the you know the the impression of more sustain and more punch. So I'll play a couple bars without the uh, parallel compression, then I'll engage it. Ready? You hear the rattly part of the snare, the, 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 after the attack, the attack sounds more important too, but after that is what I really was after. I was after that, that strainer rattling. Okay. Now that's trick number one. Trick number two is distortion. I didn't want a clean drum set. I had that for a while when I was working on it. It was just boring because it's such a simple repetitive part with not a lot of track count. I was like, let's make the drums a thing. So I brought up distortion and what we have going here is a decapitator followed by a little bit of EQ from SSL here, just kind of dipping out some of the woofy part of the kick drum and whatnot. And I will play you that bus by itself. And again, I control it independently on separate aux send. So I can, instead of a, sending the whole drum kit, I can send as much as the ki of the kick as I want to, as much of the snare as I want to, that kind of a thing. Here that is. It's a little too much, right? So the whole idea is, and I'll mute that, play the, the raw drums with the parallel only, and then I'll engage the distortion after a couple bars. Ready? All of a sudden, our hi-fi sound goes completely away, and it gets a little, a little raunchy and a little nasty in a fun way. It just, you know, to me, it it really put a different dimension, a different spin on this song. And you will notice I did use a snare helper, a little snare sample. I see some of you guys I know will comment, "Hey, he's cheating." But what I, what I noticed is the snare drum. I loved it on its own. It was great until I added the amount of distortion that I wanted, and I lost some of the real snare drum snap on the top and the air. So I needed a little bit of this to just layer on top of what I had destroyed in the, in the other drum. And together. So it still sounds like a real snare drum, it's just a nasty one. So <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Okay, now let's talk about the acoustic guitar. So the acoustic guitar, as you can see, was compressed quite a bit before it got to me. And they recorded it just like the original in mono, which is cool. I, I, I used it that way for a little while. And I thought, you know what? Warren said to have fun. If I was doing this now, I would want a little more size uh, just to be modern. So here, here's the acoustic guitar by itself as compressed through the opto comp. Okay, and obviously a little, a little EQ. I used all SSL channel strips. Uh, I thought just, to, again, trying to do something different and be modern. I wanted like that SSL 9000 sound. So everything is EQ'd with SSL. But for fun, I was like, okay, let's have the, what if the acoustic guitar takes up a little more room than it did in the original mix? So I brought in the Brainworks uh, Stereo Maker here. And let me, let me play you the guitar in mono, and then I'll engage this, and you hear it just gets a little bit more important, just a little bit more size to it. So what that allows me to do, I could pan it off to the side of the singer just a little bit to counteract some of the other stuff that's going on that's a little left heavy, but it could still wrap around her. Like, here's her vocal, here's the guitar, I was able to put here's the vocal and here's the guitar to where it still had a little bit of a wrap around her, even though it leaned to one side, if that makes sense. So that was that was something that was fun to do. Okay, let's let's look at one more thing. And this is something you, you will encounter. So on the vocals, anytime you use an optical compressor that's in the nature of an LA-2A, in this case, the OptoComp, they're slow. And that's what we love about them is that the release is kind of, it, it starts releasing fast and then gets slower and slower. And that's how we get that creamy optical effect that we've all fallen in love with on vocals and bass guitars and things. But what you'll notice sometimes when you, when you use an LA-2A by itself, 
is you get a little bit of a spike because it's slow to reattack. If the phrasing is punchy, you'll get a spike, right? And then it'll clamp down and it's real nice and smooth, a little bit of a spike. So what's real common to do is follow something like an LA-2A with an 1176, something that's fast, a distressor, that kind of a thing, or vice versa. Some people prefer, prefer to put the fast thing first and then let the buttery, creamy optical compressor do its thing. There's not a right or wrong answer. I've done it both ways, both work. But what I'll show you is I'm gonna take and remove the compressor that I added on top of uh, the compression that Warren and Eric had. And here is the vocal sound. I want to live, I want to give. I've been a miner for a heart of gold. Okay, it sounds great during those sustains. Sounds great. But you'll see right here on the screen and right here, I mean, it's punchy and it kind of jumps out of the speakers a little more than what our modern mixes usually do. You know, we're just a little more clamped down now. So I followed it with a distressor emulation here from uh, Plugin Alliance. And here's what that's doing. You'll see it's set to a pretty fast attack, number two, and a, and, and a, and a you know, reasonably fast release, number three. And um, you can see it's kind of kicking in just as she punches the words to just kind of knock it down into the track just a little. I want to live, I want to give. I've been a miner for a heart of gold. That's all it needed. Just a little bit of, uh, you know, knock, knocking that those peaks down into the track. And I thought it sounded great. That's just a few things that I, that I did that I thought you guys might find interesting. But overall, you know, my impression on the, without using any compression other than what they used uh, when tracking, just a little bit here and there, stereo bus, whatever. I thought it sounded great. Again, it really reminded me of mixing from analog tape. So uh, nice job, Eric and Warren, or whoever recorded this. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs>